So I'm Denise Fitzpatrick, I'm the End of Life Project uh, uh, coordinator for, for a project that's been going now for uh, just on two years. Next slide, thanks. I also have control issues and I'm a bit twitchy that I'm not in control of the slides, yeah. especially as I have animations. <laughs> So this was the quest question that kicked off um, our uh, the development of the framework. Next click. But it wasn't the only thing. We had things like Health Roundtable, we had um, national um, discussions about end of life care, and we also had adverse incident monitoring and our own um, normal um, patient complaints process that all said look Houston, you've got a bit of a problem here with your end of life care. Another click, there's our roll of the dice. Next slide. So, before the project we did some uh, baseline measures and um, what I did was had a look at patient, patients who died in a three month period and found that 15% of those patients had, um, who were expected deaths, so these were expected deaths, had had no resuscitation plan in place at the time of death 21% of them um, didn't have a resuscitation plan completed until quite late in their admission. So they may have been day 19 of a 21 day and they died on day 21. And it was day 19 they got their, had their first um, do not resuscitate conversation. 23% of deaths, the end of life decision was made by either the MET team or an ICU doctor who's been called in to have a chat. And 24% of patients had the Liverpool Care Pathway, which was being trialled in two of our, um, in one medical, one surgical ward at the time and um, in one of the subacute uh, areas. And we had advanced care planning in residential aged care only. Next slide, please. So we, we'd um, been to health roundtable discussions around end of life care and lots of places had, you know, Barwon Health has a fantastic advanced care planning program. Other places had had success with the Liverpool Care Pathway or some sort of end of life um, plan. Northern Health described their goals of care planning process around discussing limitations of treatment. So there was a lot of places doing single things really well. And so while we were behind the eight ball to start off with, it gave us the opportunity to cherry pick things that were, people were doing really well and put it all into a framework that meant that our approach to end of life care was going to be comprehensive integrated and coordinated and to take the gamble out of end of life care. Thank you. But first of all, we needed to hear from the experts. So we had our health round table discussions. We had a look at the literature. Um, and then we, um, well, Jade here, who will be speaking next, said this is too good an opportunity not to do some research around. So we jumped in with some ethics approval and we asked um, 13, uh, next of kin of people who died with us in 2013. What is end of life care like here at BHS? What's been your experience? And Jade's going to speak um, in depth about that in the next talk. And we also set up um, some focus groups, two with healthcare professionals and one with consumers to um, try and then gather some um, ideas around what good end of life care looks like and then we could theme it up next slide, thanks. So these were the key themes. I'm not going to go into this too much because Jade's going to cover this in depth. Next slide. When we first <coughs> set out to develop the framework, we thought, right, the scope is going to be from the diagnosis of a life-limiting illness right through until death. But after our discussions, our focus groups, our interviews, and then reading the literature, our scope actually had to expand to advanced care plans are probably best done when you're well. People don't really like to talk about um, future healthcare wishes when they're in crisis. And, and there was murmurings um, from families about after their loved one had died. You know, the door shuts. They may have had a long um, relationship with, that, uh, with our health service or um, with the uh, nursing staff over a period of weeks and suddenly that was it and they weren't really sure what to do next. Next slide, thanks. So we, had a, we um, pulled out our elements of the framework. We, we um, said that advanced care planning was it really a really important element. Identifying people at risk of deteriorating or dying, and that would um, inform us about who needs to have a, a discussion around goals of care planning. Then we needed a good 
um, care of the dying management plan that would enable us to give good palliative care no matter where in the hospital that patient was dying and then we had to consider bereavement. Now they were all wrapped up in our um, in the values of the hospital that sit with um, culture values and behaviour that are um, articulated in our strategic plan and the big ticket item that came out of our focus groups and our interviews was communication, the importance of doing it well. Next slide, thanks. So this was our goals of care plan. Um, based on um, one that was developed originally in the, uh, through the Southern Tasmanian Area Health Network and then um, put into the Victorian context um, through Northern Health with um, Dr Barbara Hayes. So um, it w became our alternative to the do not resuscit resuscit resuscitate approach and it changed the conversation from do you want to be resuscitated to what are your goals of care for this admission. Um, had lots of challenging conversations about the content, discussions about what the role is of the medical emergency team in terms of, or the rapid response teams in terms of um, managing distressing symptoms. And our goal of Care C, you might not be able to see here, is treatment aimed at symptom management and quality of life. So we've called it goal of Care C is palliative. And that's the language that more and more <coughs> is to say that if you have a life limiting illness, then you are in a palliative phase doesn't mean that you're actively dying so that's goal of care D so that was challenging for people also next slide so last year um, one of our uh, anesthetic registrars pulled 1280 records of people who died in June last year so our goals of care plan had been in for one month so it's sort of a baseline thing she looked at um, minimum inclusion criteria to see who should have had a timely discussion about goals of care and limitations of treatment. 8%. So this isn't of people who've died, this is across our entire organisation. 8% had had a discussion about what their goal of care was for that admission within um, the first 48 hours of admission. A further 51% um, had had one outside that 48 hour period and 41% had no goals of care plan in place. Our organisation's changed significantly since then. So I did a point prevalence survey across June, July and August um, with 85 uh, people, uh, point prevalence, so it was each ward, 85 people fitted the criteria with 75% having had a goals of care plan in place within 48 hours, 12% outside the 48 hour mark and we had a further 13% that haven't got a goals of care plan in place. They were mostly our surgical cohort and that will be a room for some work for us, thanks. We used the Liverpool Care Pathway um, experience to develop our own care of the dying management plan and um, that's, we've tried to make that patient focused and user friendly for medical staff. Thank you, next slide. Advanced care planning, we we're lucky enough to have Bill Sylvester on our um, committee and we've tried to follow the Barwon model um, without actually paying to do facilitation in the GP clinics, but a focus on primary care. So we're working in partnership with um, Decision Assist and partnering with the GP practice as a pilot, training up their um, practice nurses and developing a business case for an ACP coordinator. Next one, thanks. So um, communication is the hot topic not just in our health service, but nationally with Dr. Ranjana <coughs> Srivastava and um, the Harvard professor Atul Gawande saying, we're not doing it well. Next one, thanks. So, and again, <laughs> the challenge of the difficult conversation is uh, the evidence suggested we needed to offer explicit communication skills training. So we've locally developed a discussing goals of care workshop, which has got both a didactic component, but more particularly a role play experiential component, pitched to registrars at this stage. And uh, that's, we're only in the early stages of that. Thank you. So our framework, um, we're trying to make end of life more than a roll of the dice. Over 80% of patients who die with us have a goals of care plan in place within 48 hours of admission. Over 80% who die now are either for comfort measures or symptom management um, rather than still aiming at cure. 
and 80% of those who die are on a CDMP in subacute. We're still working on the acute and quickly running through. Our next steps are to roll out the framework document, which is um, just finished last week, the, the whole document. Um, the business <coughs> case for advanced care planning, building capability for the difficult conversation, as I said. Um, CDMP sustainability project, getting that going more in the acute setting. And we're really keen to do some more research, so we'll repeat the interviews and so forth. Much over. <laughs> <laughs>